Right, hi, uh, Elke again. So by now we're at part four of the series of six presentations on diving with the oceanics and site diving practices and guidelines. Uh, part four is actually a direct continuation of part three because both of them are dealing really with the practical guidelines of what to do and what not to do when you're diving with oceanics. So uh, ideally you've seen part three and just continuing on with part four now. We're going to jump straight back into the things that are important to deal with when we're diving with the oceanics. Very quick reminder, the two chapters that I dealt with before was staying calm, um, keeping your eyes on the shark, and to control your buoyancy. Yeah, those were the three. So number four now, as a continuation, um, again with a reminder of what, that we're dealing with wild predators, and that you need to avoid doing anything that makes you look like prey. So point number four, actually, the next one, is that you limit your time on the surface. Um, I mentioned what oceanics are feeding on. A lot of their food, actually, they're finding on or next to the surface. So this is their absolute comfort zone. Uh, they're looking for animals in trouble. Uh, they're looking for garbage that was disposed of. And they're looking for carcasses floating around. All this is happening on the surface. Yeah, so this is the prime area where they're looking for food their comfort zone. So you don't really want to be there unless it's necessary. Because of course also for us being on the surface, it's quite uncomfortable and it's very vulnerable. We don't have the three dimensions to play with that we have in diving. We're stuck in the two dimensions on the surface. And if you then have a shark that very persistently approaches you and investigates you, that is very nerve-wracking and a lot of people get very scared in a situation like this very quickly. So it's easier to avoid this as much as you can. And the two factors that I said, the behavior of the sharks and our own vulnerability, are the reasons why there is no swimming or snorkeling allowed here in the Egyptian Red Sea in any areas where oceanic white tip sharks are possible. And that pretty much means the marine parks, the Brothers, Daedalus, uh, even Rocky Island, places like Elphinstone, and also places like the St. John's Plateau, at least in certain parts of the season. Yeah, so wherever there's a possibility for oceanics, do not allow anybody to jump in the water for swimming or snorkeling, yeah, only for diving. Um, then, if you're jumping off the back of the boat, do not spend any additional time on the surface. Do not jump in, turn around, have a chat with your buddy. You might already have an oceanic at your fins, which was attracted by the splash that you created when you jumped in. So if the conditions allow it, jump in with your buddy, drop down to five meters, so that by the time your bubbles are clearing, you're already in a much calmer situation to deal with a potential approach of an oceanic. And the same is obviously true for coming back to the boat. And again, there's a video example for this one. So again, try to avoid additional time on the surface. So if you look at the divers coming back here again at the brothers, there's two divers close to the ladders. Fine. The oceanic is not interested in them. He's interested in the person that is already on the surface and finning back, creating lots of splashes on the surface to go back to the boat. Absolutely unnecessary. Stay down in five meters, go to the shock line, finish your safety stop or your anchor line, see that the ladders above you are clear, and then just ascend underneath the ladders, climb up, no flopping around on the surface necessary at all, and this oceanic potentially would not even have come or approached any of these divers in that situation. Yeah, so that's another example for this one. In case you need to use a surface line, and this of course, again, this is mainly now uh, information for the guides, if you have to use it to get your diver safely to the reef, you can. If you have other options, you should take them, especially if you know that there's oceanics around. But if this is the only safe option, by all means, use it, just brief it properly. And that means the divers should jump in off the back, first thing of course, holding onto the surface line, and then stop moving. Look around, see if there's an oceanic that was attracted to the splash, because if you then stop moving and don't do anything, that oceanic will turn away again and lose interest. And then, from this point, use your hand to pull yourself to the reef. Do not fin along that surface line, creating splashes and movement on the surface. And once you're next to the reef, then you can start your dive, descend along the reef wall. These sharks are normally not interested in the reef anyway, so the moment that you then start your dive, they've probably turned away already and are still somewhere around the boats. Yeah? So if, if necessary, it can be done. And that, of course, is the same for coming back with a surface line. Surface next to the reef, hold the line, easy hand over hand movement, and once in a while check and look around you if there's a shark approaching. If there is, you stop your movement, you hold on, wait for the shark to lose interest, and then you continue. 
Yeah, this would be the idea for the use of a surface line if it's necessary with oceanics around. And then it continues. Check for oceanics before you actually jump in the water. And now it doesn't matter if it's jumping off the back of the big boat so that you're not landing on one or rolling out of a zodiac. Oceanics do not appreciate being rolled on by 10 or 12 divers. That will be a very frantic and erratic interaction straight away at the start of a dive that nobody really needs. Now, from the surface, if you look down before jumping in, it's easy to see if there's a shark right underneath you. You're sitting in the zodiac, level with the surface, it's maybe more difficult, but there's a seaman standing there, a zodiac driver. Ask them, is there any activity around before you decide to roll in with a whole zodiac or maybe even two, just to avoid this initial frantic interaction right on the surface. And of course, there is a certain surface activity that we cannot avoid, and this is zodiac pickups. But again, be efficient. Reduce the number of divers that are on the surface for extended periods of time. So if you really have a big group that needs to surface together, and you've seen oceanics before, then you might want to stay down and organize people going up. Send them up along the SMB line, wait for the zodiac to pick one or two of them up, which can be done quite quickly and efficiently, and then send up the next one or two, and stay in control about how many people are on the surface and that they're not on the surface for a long time. Yeah, this is the easiest way. For very nervous divers, very nervous guests that you're dealing with, you can also tell them the moment they come to the surface, take off their scuba unit, inflate the BCD, that they can get in the Zodiac first, and that the Zodiac driver can always collect the floating scuba unit after. So the main motivation for people is to get away from the surface as quickly as possible. That is the best way to do this. All through, though, try to do it as calmly as possible because anything frantic, anything erratic, is attractive for these sharks. So try to stay calm by being efficient and moving as quickly as you can, actually. Okay? And of course, for the surface situation, it is a really bad idea to pull guests behind the zodiac back to the big boat because they don't want to get themselves in a zodiac, they prefer climbing up the ladders. This is like pulling bait behind a zodiac for the, for the oceanics. So whenever there's oceanics around, this is not an option, and this should be made clear to your guests and to the seamen in the, boat, in the zodiacs as well. Yeah, some guests want to avoid it, they're too lazy, they're too unfit, uh, too overweight, whatever the problem is, but again, with oceanics around, they have to get themselves in the zodiac and they will not be pulled back on the surface to the big boat. Okay, And then the final point to deal with, and again that's a pretty important one, close approaches. These sharks, because of their confidence, because of their curiousness, could approach people very, very closely. So what do you do? Let's first start with how do you avoid the close approaches. And that's actually quite simple. Um, oceanic whitehead sharks are much more likely to approach single divers. Yeah, they can watch them, they can watch them from underneath, they see the silhouette, they can decide which angle they want to approach them from, this is perfect. So the moment that you have even a buddy team or a group of divers together, oceanics are less likely to come very close to them. That's point number one. And then again, oceanics, uh, there are not reef sharks. So if you stay close to the reef wall, you can avoid the majority of close approaches as well. Yeah, it's not that oceanics never come close to the reef, but it's rare. So the most likely scenario where you will meet oceanics and where you might be encountered closely is when you're out in the blue, in the shallows, either around the mooring boats or even further out in the blue, and then of course if you're alone. This is the prime situation where an oceanic will come very close to you and will be very persistent in investigating you. So again, stay with your body, stay close to the reef, and that's easy to avoid. Okay? But okay, what if it happens? If a shark comes within close range of you, and close range is really now a matter of definition. For me, close range means anything half a meter, 30 centimeters, so pretty much arm's length. Okay, that's my definition of a close approach. There's two things that you can do um, to help yourself and to not actually be touched by a shark or to really be that closely investigated. The first one is what we call the water wave. Yeah, you can push a water wave towards an appropriate approaching shark to keep it at a distance, to make it turn away. This is one that should be used by experienced divers because it's a bit difficult to get this idea across to inexperienced divers and if they get it wrong, it might have the opposite effect, it might get that shark more interested. 
But if it's done properly, it's a good way to keep a shark at a distance. Now, pushing the water wave, um, why does that work all together? What's the idea? This goes back to the sensory systems that were mentioned in presentation one. In this case, I'm talking about the pressure sense that sharks have all along the sides of their heads and also along their body uh, sides. So a pressure sense that gets a water wave pushed towards it from close range will react. It will be an overkill, actually, from this close range, like 30, 50 centimeters. So the overkill for the shark actually instinctively means something big is coming towards me that pushes the bow wave in front of it. So they normally pull up an entertaining membrane on the side and they head away. I'll show you a very short video that can show this, uh, so, but just to explain the situation first. So we're going to have an oceanic approaching from the left side, coming towards a guest that is down here at the corner, that actually turned her back towards him already. And then from up here comes a diver, which is actually me, with a white plastic slate in her hand, and uses this to push a water wave towards the approaching shark from very, very close range. It's a short video, but you will see the reaction of the shark to it. So here comes the oceanic. This is the guest down here, and this is the white plastic slate. Yeah, so it's wafted towards the shark, and she immediately turns away and takes off. And she doesn't come back afterwards. Yeah, so this is the idea of the water wave. Now, done properly, as I said, this works actually really well. But there's a few things that are really, really important. This, first of all, it needs to be a proper wave. Anything less, and it will not work. It needs to be done on the first or second approach of that shark. If there's a shark that has been actually between divers and their fins for the last five or ten minutes, they have experienced a lot of pressure changes, and of course, the pressure sensors have adjusted and have adapted to that one. So, and of course, also it needs to be close range. So if you explain this to a guest, somebody that doesn't have experience with this kind of shark, close approach for them means something different. So they might see a shark that is still like 10, 15 meters away from them, coming towards them, but still quite far away, and they will start wafting their hands in this direction. That, of course, never gets to the shark. It's too far away. It's not a proper wave. And actually does the opposite, because it's erratic movements that create signals that the shark will get interested in. So in terms of mentioning this to guests, this is really sort of a judgment call that guides need to make. As I said, if the guests get this wrong, it can have the opposite effect. It's working if it's done properly, but you have to decide uh, if you just want to use it for yourself or if you're happy to talk to other people about this as well. And then the second option for a close to prevent the shark from touching you when they're really, really close is to actually try a buffer between you and the shark. And this could be a lot of things. It could be your fins. Could be a camera. Uh, some people are talking about bringing shark sticks back. A shark stick is a telescope uh, stick, actually. It's originally this long, and then you can extend it to three times the length. To be clear, like all the others, this is supposed to be buffers, not weapons. So also the shark stick is not to be used to poke a shark or hit a shark from a distance. It's supposed to be held so that the shark is bumping into an object and not into something soft like the leg or the arm of a diver that they might want to explore further. Yeah, this is the only reason to use it. Using it as a weapon, again, you might actually sorry, piss off that shark, and this is not something that you want to do. And again, I have an example for the use of a camera as a buffer. Yeah, so again, this is a longer video, so I can, can explain it along the way. Diver here with a camera uh, a stroke arm, and there comes the oceanic. This is actually me with my camera, so yes, it was filming that. So the shark gets interested in the stroke and actually nudges it, which is very, very rare, to be honest. Over these 15 years, that has rarely happened. And he keeps coming back because he's interested. I'm also I'm by myself in the blue. I mean, the boat is closed, but I'm uh, not really with other people, which is fine because I want to take pictures for the research. So he circles me very closely. So in the beginning, I take pictures, but then actually I stop taking the pictures and I focus on just holding the camera between me and the shark so that he doesn't bump into me and into my body. I'm not pushing the shark with the camera, I'm not hitting the shark with the camera, I'm really just holding it in place so that whatever he bumps into is a piece of metal or a piece of plastic and not something soft that might be more interesting. So of course I need to move my fins because he's very close to me, so eventually he gets interested in my fins, so I'm almost turning upside down just to make sure that the camera is always between me and that shark. Uh, and it can be the camera, it can be the strobe arm, and eventually, although it takes a while, like in this moment the shark then loses interest and he leaves. So this, again, was not an aggressive shark, but it was a very curious shark, and he stayed close for a long time. So this is a matter of a bit of experience and self-control, to stay calm, to just calmly move, turn with the shark, and keep your buffer in place. 
yeah, this is the idea, and then it's actually working, because eventually they will lose interest, because really inanimate objects are not something that they're really very interested in. Now, of course, what do you do if you don't have a buffer? And then you might actually get to the situation where as an absolute last resort, you might have to use your hand to guide that shark away from you. Yeah, I'm not saying punching, pushing or anything. I'm talking about decisively, but still rather gently, pushing that shark away. And again, I will run a video to show you a situation like this. Uh, this is just the first frame before I run it. So just to explain this, out here, you can already see the oceanic. This is a video that was actually sent to me by a guest from the St. John's Plateau quite a few years ago, and he wanted me to explain the behavior of the shark that you will see in a second. Um, I normally don't like doing this, I'm not there, I see a small video, I have no idea what's going on around it, but actually on the video you can see that the shark picks up something to eat. And you will see this, there's this white piece floating here, once I run the video, you can see the shark actually turning around, opening the mouth, and this white piece disappears, so he picked up something to eat. And then, as he swims along, there's a second piece that falls down. It will be on the screen as well, and I will point it out when you can see it. And this piece drops down right beside where the divers are. I have no idea what it was, but it was something edible enough for the black and white pilot fish that are with a shark to come towards it and to eat it. Yeah, right beside the divers. So the shark picked up something to eat, and there's potentially still the smell uh, of something else that is there. And that explains why in this video this shark had to be pushed. And it's a very specific situation involving food, which actually is illegal to do with the oceanics or with any shark to feed them here in Egypt, because as a predator, of course, they change their behavior when food is involved. But let me run the video and you will see the reaction of the shark and the reaction of the diver. So here we go. Oceanic now bending sideways and swallows the white piece. And then the other piece is this piece that's dropping down here. I hope you can see that. It falls down, and we have no idea what it is. Black and white pilotfish are coming and grabbing it right beside the divers. And now just watch what this shark is doing as the response to this. So he basically comes down straight towards the guy and goes very close, and he doesn't have a buffer, so he uses his hand to push him away. And that happens now on a number of occasions, the shark can get quite persistent, and the guy keeps on using the solid side of the head to put his hand against it and to push the shark away. Yeah, it's decisive, but still quite gentle, so he's not overly aggressive. And I think this was the perfect reaction to this situation. Most likely explanation for what the shark is doing, actually, is that he tries to chase these people away from the food that he's looking for. Yeah, this is something I explained in the second presentation. Oceanics around the food source can be aggressive because they want to get rid of the competition. So most likely what this shark is doing, he's trying to get rid of the competition and he perceives the divers as competition for the food that he is looking for. So this is what he's doing. He's not interested in the divers as food. Yeah, he has the hand of the guy right beside his head, close to his mouth, on a number of occasions. He makes no move to bite the guy, he doesn't open his mouth, he doesn't show any other signs of this kind of aggression or of feeding activity. So this is a shark that tries to get rid of the competition for food the best way that he can, basically bullying them out of the way. Yeah, so why do I think that this was a good reaction? Because the person on the video was not overly aggressive. If he had now decided to punch that shark, he might have gotten himself bitten. Because now then the person starts being aggressive and the shark thinks he has to defend himself against that person. So be careful with aggressive behavior towards a shark because the defensive reaction that you're triggering might get very, very dangerous. Yeah? Sharks are much quicker, they have this quite impressive set of teeth, so you don't want to be the trigger of any aggression in this situation. Yeah, but as I said, this this situation was provoked by food in the water, and what we're normally talking about is natural interactions between divers and sharks in their environment without adding this part. Because again, it changes the behavior of especially sharks like oceanics. Yeah, so this is the idea. So if it's absolutely necessary, this can be the last resort. Okay, but yeah, as I said, it's hopefully not gonna happen to a lot of people like this. Okay, and that concludes the safety guidelines or diving practices with these oceanics. So we are ideally, uh, presentations three and four uh, should be watched in order. 
Um, but yeah, this is pretty much um, the most important do's and don'ts of uh, diving safely with Oceanics here in Egypt. Thank you very much.